Hi, my name is Alexandra, and I'm a bibliophile. Welcome back to A Lovely Jaunt, where we read better, not more. Today I want to do a little book chat with you guys. So I have this problem where I will read plenty of books in between the books that I actually talk about on my channel, but never really get the opportunity to talk about them because there are books that I read for fun or I didn't really take that heavy of notes and I didn't prepare for like a full series where I might do multiple episodes on it, which is how I really prefer to talk about books in a really in-depth way. But I read a couple of books for Victober, only two, but they were really fun and I felt like, well, I don't want to lose this opportunity to talk about these books because they're great books and um, I can put them together in one video and it can be enough content for that. If you're wondering why there's like a cage over here in my video, we're trying to crate train my husky. Um, and so that's, that's why we have a different angle. It's kind of ruining my shot of my bookcases, which training in huskies, anybody out there has a husky, I'm sure you can relate. It's uh, you have to be very patient um, and consistent and then exercise the dog so it has no resistance left. But anyway, that's what we're working on with him. And okay, I'll update you, see how it goes. Should be interesting. So honestly, uh, nothing like a Victorian literature month to make you realize how slowly I read or make me realize how slowly I read compared to other people. It was amazing, the Victo not only the quantity and quality of Victober content that came out, and I'm filming this in December, so like way behind, but on top of that, like the quantity and just like the sheer page numbers that people were able to get through while also having this great content to produce at the same time, it really blows my mind because I just, I, I can't create content at that level. And I also like, even if I weren't making booktube, I don't think I could keep up with reading at that level. So I am extraordinarily impressed. I never really thought about it before because I don't do like book wrap ups or anything like that. But it's like, even with my, even if I were to choose to do that, I'd have like two books every month. And there are people out there who are like, I read 12 books. And I'm like, what on earth is that? Okay, so the first book I read for Victober was Dracula. I wasn't going to participate at first because as you know, I have this massive reading list for the great books and so I'm trying to like be disciplined with myself. But after doing the Iliad and the Odyssey back to back and then going straight into the Old Testament of the Bible, it seemed like a really heavy lift. So I was like, it's October. I've never read Dracula before. It's Victober. This feels good. So this book is written as an epistolary. We get letters between characters. We get diary entries. We get news articles. I've mentioned this in other videos, but every time I read an epistolary novel, not only do I really enjoy it, but I also really feel how constraining that form is. It's a really confining structure. So even though it's very similar to a first person narrative, because it's written obviously with I, I did this, Dear Diary, I went to and had brunch with my friend, we essentially know what the narrator knows. The novel has to sort of construct ways in which the letter or the diary entry is also plausible in addition to that a little bit confining first person narration. So to maintain the narrative thread, this sometimes becomes a little bit ridiculous. So one of my favorite examples of how funny this can be is when Harker, who is the first character who's giving us narration in the book, kind of gives us the first quarter. He's visiting Castle Dracula and he's sort of figuring out that there's something wrong with this dude. Something is seriously wrong. So he decides to do some investigating, which requires him to climb out of his win the window of his room, because now he's been locked into his window. Clue number one that your client is a weirdo. And this is now at the second time he's done this because he's like been locked in his chamber. He's climbing down the castle wall and into the window of Dracula's chamber to do some investigation. Um, so he investigates Dracula's room and he finds a stairway down to a crypt. It's so beautiful, it's so creepy. And just as he's entered the crypt, the door slams behind him and he's locked in the chamber. And oh no, what will happen to our hero? And yes, this novel is so delightfully histrionic. And Harker is like, but luckily, shwink, <laughs> I kept my journal in my pocket so I can uh, ease myself and take this time since I'm locked in here to narrate all these events to you, dear diary. So that just, 
cracked me up. Like you're in the middle of this distressing situation. You think you're dealing with some sort of undead person who fe feeds on the living. You're trapped in a crypt in the castle of the middle of nowhere with a language barrier because you don't speak Romanian or whatever. And you're like, well, at least I can, at least I can write in my diary. It just, it just cracks me up. <laughs> so you can see how, how this narrative requires the telling of events of like, that we need to know that Harker got trapped in the crypt, but who's gonna tell these events? Well, if Harker has his diary, then he can tell them themselves, but it's just like a bit awkward justifying like why a person would do that or where the diary is or like, what, you have your, your like fountain pen in your pocket? It has like a golf pencil, like anyway. So he's all locked up. It can't be a letter to his boss or fiance or anything like that, but as an avid journal keeper myself, there's no way, there is no way I am doing this when I'm locked in a vampire script. I'm, I'm trying to get out. Um, also my journal is probably up on my desk, not in my pocket, like I don't even know. Anyway, you get the point. There's a few other places where this happens as well. Uh, and to me, it totally does not ruin the book. What it does is it just makes the scene maybe unintentionally humorous. So a scene that was meant to be dramatic now becomes just a source of hilarity for me personally. I think another thing that really stuck out to me in this reading was the experience of reading this as a modern reader rather than as a contemporary of this book's publication. And I think those experiences would have been extraordinarily different not just for the humorous aspects of it where it's like to me it's funny but to them it probably really did feel dramatic but also like how familiar the story is and how familiar the horror tropes are to me and i wonder if they would not have been so like cliche i sus I'm, I'm gonna assume with a certain level of certainty that it didn't feel like a cliche to them it felt original to them so would it have been like horrifying at this revelation of blood drinking where I'm just like waiting for this information to come out where Dr. Van Helsing is gonna tell us, oh yes, it's a vampire, you know? It's like, ah, ha ha, you know? But for them, like, oh, this new creature that they've never heard of before. This other thing that's probably quite different is my sense of Victorianism as being quite quaint and old fashioned versus Victorians themselves thinking of it as being quite modern and using breaking edge technology. So an example of this where it becomes really clear is when Mina is transcribing everyone's journal into one document so they can see all the evidence together. And one character involved in the investigation is Dr. John Seward, but he keeps his journal as a recording, an audio recording on a phonograph. Previously, this was how he kept notes on his patients. And when Mina finds this out, she's like super excited and fascinated. She's never seen a recording photogra phonograph before. And that scene really brought to the fore the way this novel is fused, sort of the latest technology of its time with Van Helsing's knowledge of folk tradition and medicine to defeat this monster. So I think for us, Victorian style is kind of a code, a, short, a sort of shorthand for creepy haunted stories. I think I was even rewatching Emma Thompson's Sense and Sensibility and the scene where Marianne is sick and we don't know if she's gonna like make it through the night suddenly turns like Victorian in style, even though that's like not the proper historical period, obviously for a Jane Austen novel. She's like in a nightgown with like lace up to her throat and the lighting and shots all turn gothic, you know? And so I think it becomes a sort of like visual shorthand and cultural shorthand for us to say, this is scary or this is creepy. And there's good reasons we associate these types of things with Victorianism. Not only was Dracula published during this time, but so was Frankenstein. That one even more so steeped in the latest discoveries of science and technology. We had the rise of spiritualism and seances and that sort of thing. And there are other tropes too, the dusty castle, the howling wolves. I wonder, were these already tired tools of the trade or did they feel fresh and to contemporary readers? I'd be really curious to know. I guess I should go back and like see if there are reviews of this book from that time period and see what they were saying about it. There's one other point that I'd like to make about this novel. My hair is falling out of its bun. And that is about how Britishy it is. 
super Britishy. So what do I mean by that? Well, there's this fascination, but almost like a xenophobic quality to the way it talks about other cultures. Since we are dealing with Eastern Europe, that's really where we see it. So there's the whole stiff upper lip thing as well. So Mina is constantly being complimented for holding it together. She's not a weak woman who faints type of thing, although she does do that. And the, and the funny thing is, is that in the midst of telling us that Mina is this great like exemplar of a, a strong British woman who's rational and reasonable and almost like masculine in her, like she's a good character because she's more masculine than other women. I like how that's a thing. But <laughs> at the same time that it's doing this, like the prayer graph previous would be like her falling to her knees in a fit of histrionic drama like clinging to Dr. Van Helsing and begging him to help them. This happens several times, but no, they're not dramatic at all. Not at all. Perhaps the most Britishy thing ever to happen in a novel ever is a scene where Dracula has like mind controlled a swarm of rats to attack our crew of heroes. And one of them basically like pulls a pair of terriers out of his pockets and sends them on a merry hunt, like straight up telly ho, you know? <laughs> like let's a whistle he's whistling at these dogs it's just like it's so so funny but i hope you guys are getting a sense of how much i love this book i flew through it like it kept me up at night because it was so jam-packed with plot with humor with drama with investigations you know um it, it's a, this book is just a really really fun read it is a treasure it is a delight yes it also expresses attitudes of sexism and racism that a modern person will definitely find distasteful as you're reading it just be aware of that it's a product of its time it's definitely a product of i think what might have been a typical attitude at that time and i don't think that's something that we should just gloss by but i also don't think it makes it something where this book should be banned or, or just not approached at all. I think it reflects the common beliefs of its era and we need to recognize that that's how people thought. The book is also just really fun. <laughs> the characters are people you want to work for, the plot will keep you up past your bedtime, it's unintentionally hilarious, it's honestly pretty accessible, and because of that, um, the more familiar tone of the letters and the diaries and the news articles, it's sort of like written at a very colloquial level, I would say. So I think if you haven't read it, I think you will probably enjoy it, even if you don't typically pick up classics. I think this is a really great book to pick up, so that's my recommendation. Okay, let's move on to the second novel. Middlemarch. So the second novel I read was Middlemarch by George Eliot. I had to read this for a Victorian lit course that I took in college, but my professor was honestly kind of lame. You know, you know that level of teaching where she's kind of just checking to see if you did the reading and if you understood it? Like her kind of like her discussion style was kind of just like what happened next and what happened next, but no real analysis. I was disappointed in that. It's like sixth grade level stuff. Anyway, because of that, I don't think I really realized how much I love Victorian literature. Because now, as I'm going back and reading some of these books, I'm like, oh my gosh, these are phenomenal. I wish we, I really wish we had taken more time to do an in-depth study. I basically didn't want Victober to end as is what I'm trying to say. So I'm really glad I reread this novel and this book would be well worth doing like a whole series on like I normally do, but I haven't got the time at the moment. So we're going to just do a little short one. So this novel does include some marriage plot that is so common among Victorian novels, but it also goes way beyond that. In fact, the bulk of the story is actually examining the marital relationships like post. It's like, it is the everything that happens on the happily ever after, right? There are two major couples that we follow through their courtships and marriages. We see how they react to marriage being different than what they imagined it would be, their spouses being more fallible and also more complex than they thought, and of course how outside events affect their futures. We also get a pretty good look at the life of a town as a whole. It's a pretty expansive novel actually. We see the plans and failures as they rise and fall, and actually the sort of vicissitudes of life might be the grander thematic piece of this novel. One thing that I really enjoyed about this, which honestly surprised me because I normally don't like it, was the narrative style. The narrator's voice is quite dominant. What I mean by that is that it really tells the reader pretty directly how to judge and think of the characters and events, how we're supposed to 
interpret things. And I generally like things to be open for interpretation. So I actually like it when a book ends where it's like, but did he live or what is it? You know, I'm like, yes, both, you know, but maybe because this novel is complex in other ways, I still have the opportunity to satisfy that desire in this book. I don't know. Or maybe because the narrator still explores the inner world of the characters with depth. We don't just get this godlike pronouncement of how things are, we also see how the characters perceive them. And so we see, you know, these multiple perspectives on a single event and how, you know, the whole thing is sort of, everybody has an imperfect understanding of what is happening. And so it's layered on top of each other and these chapters sort of zoom out a bit. Every chapter is, every like 20 chapters or so, we get a chapter that does not follow the main characters or part of our main plot. Instead, we get a conversation that is like among a whole set of people from a particular social strata. One time it's the doctors all talking together, another time it's whoever's at the town tavern-y type place. And this sort of like gives us the perspective of the town itself. It's essentially gossip, and yes, it's also delightful, but it also layers all those perspectives together. It really shows how badly we misunderstand each other, and, and I think it represents my interpretation of it, my sense of the argument that the book is making is like, we really have to give more grace to other people and be less judgmental than we have a tendency to be because we're super fallible and we have a very poor sense, a very poor grasp of really what's going on inside of other people's lives and why people's motivations. Dorothea, one of our main characters, at one point says, quote, people are almost always better than their neighbors think they are. And they are almost always better, except for those instances when they're worse, <laughs> right? Uh, and there's the trick, right? There, that's, that's the rub. It's like, you can't know. And so the novel, while using the narrator to make these sort of absolute pronouncements, still guides us to be careful in how we judge others because you don't really know what's going on in somebody else's life. Well, that is all I have for you today. I hope you enjoyed our little book chat. If you would like more of these informal discussions that are kind of rapid fire on just a handful of little pieces or multiple books in one, let me know. I read a ton of books that I never really make it into videos because I don't quite have enough time to put together a series or there's not enough for me to talk about. But if you like this format, then we can bring this in as well. Until next time, my name is Alexandra and I'm still a bibliophile.